Hi, I'm Pastor Stephen Pribble, pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And I'm Pastor Brian Schwertley of Reformation Fellowship, Reformed Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Reformation Forum, the program relating the unchanging truth of Scripture to current day issues. Tonight's subject is eternal security. Here's a hot one, folks. There's a lot of uh, strong opinions on both sides of this issue. Some people attend churches that really emphasize eternal security. Others <coughs> attend churches that really fight against the doctrine of eternal security. And a lot of people don't even know what the whole thing is about. But you ought to be concerned because, after all, either you are eternally secure or you are not. And you better know. You better understand. So t stay tuned as we talk about this important subject. Uh, Brian, sometimes this doctrine is called the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Could you just define it for us and maybe you could just relate it to eternal security while you're sure. talking about it? Uh, basically what the doctrine states is, is that those whom God chose before the foundation of the world because of his love, those who he loved, the elect, the chosen ones, he chose them before he even created the world, those who are born again by the Holy Spirit and truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they cannot lose their salvation. Okay, that's just it in a nutshell. Now that does not mean that true believers can't backslide and commit grievous sins. They do and they can. Okay, but the Holy Spirit will preserve them. You could call this the preservation of the saints because we're not teaching that Christians persevere themselves and in a sense earn their salvation. It's that God sovereignly preserves his people. And he guarantees because of his covenant love, he guarantees because he's all powerful and sovereign that those who die, that those who are in Jesus Christ, that are united with him in his death and resurrection, the elect, not one of them will lose their salvation. Now we call it the perseverance of the saints, and all true believers will persevere to the end and be saved. Now, there are some who believe what's called eternal security, who believe something different than we do, and they believe that a uh, person makes a decision for Christ and they can never lose their salvation and go on and sin as they please. And we don't believe that. We have a different doctrine than that. We believe that God per perseveres. He causes them to, he preserves them, but that doesn't mean they're going to go on and live in sin. They will repent, okay? So there is a difference. And we want to distinguish ourselves from antinomianism or those who believe that you make a decision for Christ and you can go out and commit adultery and smoke pot and fornicate and do anything you want and you're still going to go to heaven. That's not what we're saying. But we are saying that God will, those who are justified are sanctified, the Bible says. Those who are sanctified will be glorified. It's very simple. Christ actually does literally save a people from their sins. Those for whom Christ died will go to heaven. Not one will be lost. No one will be lost. Those for whom that Christ died for will go to heaven. They can't be lost, and that's eternal security. And we pay a lot of attention. There's, it's a controversial subject, but if you pay close attention, you'll learn a lot about it tonight. And uh, it's a very important doctrine. You know, most profession Christians in the state, they don't, they don't believe in this doctrine. They, they think that a Christian can be a, a child of God one day and then a child of Satan the next day, that they can lose their salvation and they depend everything on man's free will and, and all this sort of stuff. Now, how's the idea that a real Christian can lose his, lose his salvation and go to hell inconsistent with God's love of the elect? Well, Brian, uh, before I answer that question, let me give just a, a personal anecdote. Uh, I remember the first time uh, that I actually heard a, a consistent Arminian speak about someone <coughs> losing their salvation. Uh, I had been raised in a Baptist church where uh, the doctrine of eternal security was taught. And uh, I remember I was riding in a carpool with uh, two other individuals that were taking a a seminary level class with me. And one of the uh, uh, men was a minister in a, an Arminian church, a church uh, which uh, basically <coughs> teaches that you may lose your salvation. And uh, he just casually at one point spoke about somebody that used to be in his congregation, uh, someone who used to be a Christian. And all of a sudden it just struck me. What did I hear this guy say? I never in my life heard anybody speak of someone who used to be a Christian. Because having grown up in a church that taught the doctrine of eternal security, uh, I was uh, uh, accustomed to speaking of those that had uh, believed in Jesus Christ to those who actually were uh, justified and who made a credible profession of faith in Jesus Christ as uh, eternally secure. And so this really struck me. Someone who 
used to be a Christian? Whatever could this mean? But what does this have to do with the doctrine of God's eternal love? Well, uh, the Bible teaches that God loves his elect, and he does love them with an everlasting love. For instance, in uh, Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, we read, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. And here he's speaking to the virgin daughter of Israel, in other words, to the, uh, to the faithful ones among the nation of Israel. And he says to them, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Notice, uh, uh, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me. In other words, this isn't something that the Lord just dreamed up uh, recently. <coughs> you, notice he uses the word everlasting love. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. The word I have loved thee in the Hebrew is in the perfect tense. It indicates an action which is completed. And uh, uh, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. In other words, it's not just uh, uh, the kind of love that God has for his people isn't just that which uh, grows on a whim. Uh, it's not like uh, God just, just late in time fell in love with somebody. He says, I have loved thee with an everlasting <coughs> love. This is truly an amazing thought. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, uh, if you love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, then the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. God doesn't change his mind, and he doesn't uh, just fall into or out of love. Uh, if God loves someone, he has loved that individual from eternity. As a matter of fact, in uh, Romans chapter 8, I think, the Apostle Paul puts this in the most dramatic fa fashion, certainly memorable uh, uh, turn of language here. In Romans 8 and verse 29, he says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then a verse that uh, Brian alluded to a mo moment ago, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he also justified, them he also glorified. But notice it begins with God's foreknowledge. And I love to point this out to people. As a matter of fact, I may have mentioned this before on a program, but if you heard it then, you need to hear it again to fix it in your mind. Paul definitely does not say for what he did foreknow. In other words, he wasn't saying that God looked down through the corridors of history and saw that I was going to do something or saw that you were going to do something. He wasn't foreseeing an action here. He was knowing individuals. And the word that's used here for know uh, speaks of an intimacy of knowledge. Uh, and it, it has actually been rendered by one of the paraphrasers, I think the Williams uh, paraphrase of the New Testament, those on whom... He set his love beforehand. And that is actually a very good way of capturing the nuance in the Greek there. Whom he did foreknow. Those on whom he set his love beforehand. Uh, and I'm not speaking there of uh, changing a singular whom to a plural those. But the idea there, of, uh, the one on whom he set his love beforehand. That's actually a very good uh, translation. And then Romans 8 uh, uh, continues by saying, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the idea is that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. No created thing. It's certainly a wonderful doctrine. We'll have more to say about it in a few minutes, but let's continue on. Uh, Brian, <coughs> let me ask you a question. How is the doctrine that Christians can lose their salvation inconsistent with the doctrine of God's sovereignty? Well, it's, that's a very good point. You know, God is absolutely sovereign, and Christians are supposed to believe this, that God is con in control of all events. The Bible very specifically says that God controls the human heart. Uh, Proverbs uh, 21, verse 1, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he turn it whithersoever he will, like the rivers of water. God controls the human heart. Okay, God, uh, if God, and God has perfect foreknowledge, if God sees a person is going to have a problem or whatever, he can affect that heart and change that person's mind. Okay, God's the one in control of the human heart. God is in control of all the circumstances in a person's life. He's in control of all the events that occur in a person's life. Now, you tell me, why would God, okay, who, even if you don't believe that he's absolutely sovereign, you might believe 
in, in a type of the free will that's unscriptural. But let's say you believe in absolute uh, foreknowledge, that God knows all events perfectly. Why would God look down the quarters of time, see someone who's his child that he loves, that Christ died for, and if he saw that person uh, uh, commit, uh, fall into some kind of apostasy, why would he not get him in a car wreck or give him a heart attack and take him home before he died? See, God could do that if he wanted to. So you have to either say, well, God uh, either is not all-powerful, or God does not know the future, or God doesn't really love his children. And we just know from the answer of Pastor Pribble that God loves his children with an everlasting love, with an infinite love, a love so stupendous that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross. So you have to, you know, God is sovereign. He knows what's going to happen. And if he saw that a person was going to, you know, apostatize, he would take them home ahead of time. Not only that, God controls all events. If God would see what book or what person or the events that led him to apostasy, and God would protect him from that. In fact, that's exactly what the Bible teaches. Here's a passage from 1 Corinthians 10.13. It says here, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be, uh, that you may be able to bear it. God is faithful. That's the whole point. God will not allow you to fall into apostasy. He will preserve you if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ. And then there's another wonderful passage, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. This is a prayer of the Apostle Paul, and it's given by inspiration. It's an infallible prayer. And it's obvious that God is going to answer this prayer. In fact, l let me read this to you. 1 Corinthians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says here, he who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. That's a guarantee. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will sanctify you. He will glorify you. He is faithful. He, God, in his covenant love and his all-powerful nature will guarantee that if you're a child of God, if you're a son, of, if you're a, a believer in Jesus Christ, you will be perfect and blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. God is faithful, and he will not allow you to apostatize. God is absolutely sovereign. And like I said, the only way you can uh, get around this teaching is to either say God doesn't know the future, which is totally unscriptural, or you can say that God uh, uh, is not all-powerful, which is totally unscriptural, or you're going to have to say that God truly doesn't love his children. And that's obviously unscriptural. So what does that mean, ergo? Therefore, all of God's children will go to heaven. They cannot go to hell. It's a wonderful doctrine. It's a God-glorifying doctrine. God receives all the glory. It's a wonderful doctrine. <clears throat> you know, what are some specific passages? Because we've been talking about some implicit teaching. There are explicit passages that clearly teach that real believers can't fall away. Why don't you read some of those for us? Well, Brian, you know, this just brings up the whole idea of how the Bible harmonizes. Uh, you know, uh, if you rightly understand a doctrine in the Bible, it's not <coughs> going to be contradicted somewhere else uh, in Scripture. Uh, you know, there are those that wonder, well, how can I understand? Uh, you know, there's so many conflicting interpretations out there. How can I ever know the right one? Well, the way that we can know if we have interpreted the Bible correctly is, is our interpretation that we believe the, uh, the, the of something that we believe the Bible te is teaching, is that uh, borne out with other passages of Scripture? Or does it blatantly contradict somewhere else? You have to have the best interpretation, which is the most self-consistent interpretation. And what are uh, some of the passages that teach that real Christians cannot fall away? I think the, the strongest one and the clearest one and surely the most reassuring one for uh, those of us that love the Lord Jesus Christ would be from John chapter 10 where uh, we have um, referred to this before because it's such a marvelous passage in a number of connections. But it says, But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 